Hello, and welcome to Great.com Talks With. Today, we're talking with Brandy Bertram, Interim Chief Executive Officer at Bridges for Prosperity, an organization working with isolated communities to create access to essential healthcare, education, and economic opportunities by building trail bridges over impassable rivers. And if you're new to our podcast, please press subscribe button either on YouTube or your podcast app, because today we're going to learn about an organization that has built more than 350 trail bridges, serving over 1.2 million community members throughout the world. Hello, Brandy. Welcome to Great.com Talks. We're excited to have you here. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. I'm just honored to be joining you. And I am so excited to be here to be able to represent, if you will, the first and last mile in the walking world. One in seven people in the world are walking and our trail bridges are what help them get where they need to go. Wonderful. Very excited, very excited to learn more about your work in detail. Could you please tell us uh, what does Br Bridges for Prosperity do for someone who is not familiar with your work? Well, if... <laughs> For so many of us, how we get from point A to point B does not occupy our mind. We are so privileged to be able to get to the grocery store, to the health clinic, to our, to our school, to our job. And even our commute might be something that, that we take for granted. But for one in seven people, as I mentioned, in the, in the world, actually accessing the things that they need to survive, much less thrive, is not guaranteed. So many people globally are trapped in what we call rural isolation, and that isolation creates poverty. Bridges to Prosperity literally builds trail bridges in partnerships with communities and governments that bridge rivers that otherwise would cut people off for months, seasons at a time and prevent them from being able to thrive. And so these trail bridges, we call them trail bridges because it's more than just human feet that cross them. They're human feet, they're animal feet going to market. Oftentimes there are bicycles that cross our bridge, but it's a myriad of things that cross our bridges all around the world, 21 plus countries all around the world, three, as you mentioned, 350 plus bridges all around the world to get where they need to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as mentioned by you, we take some things for granted, but one uh, in seven uh, person uh, in the world uh, doesn't have such privilege and uh, walking is the main um, tool of transportation for many uh, communities. And you mentioned it's uh, one of the um, reasons of the poverty having been in a rural isolation and the fact your organization is addressing that issue and working together with community members and governments to build those bridges. So um, um, taking off the barrier that is being created and that's a very wonderful work. Could you please tell us how big of an issue is rural isolation both in under, underdeveloped and developing countries where you're working? It's significant. When you think about the percentage of the world that lives in rural, traditionally farming communities, it is a significant, significant number. So let me give you an example. Here in Rwanda, we are participating with our government partners in a first of its kind nationwide trail, bridging, trail bridge program. We're looking to connect over 1.1 million people by 2024 through trail bridges. Those 1.1 million people live in rural isolation currently, and that's in one small country. So the amount of people in our developing world who are facing this isolation is really quite extreme. It is, it is a significant percentage of our population. And it's not just their isolation that hurts necessarily them and their communities. It hurts us. These are communities that produce the food products that we love all around the world. So when farmers can't get to market, when farmers can't get to uh, get their farm inputs, their fertilizers, their seeds, whatever that is, that actually disrupts the value chain globally. So this isn't a matter of something that is just to solve something in one particular community alone. When we fully engage our rural communities, we are actually lifting up the economies of entire countries, regions, and globally. We are helping build stronger, more resilient nations through connectivity. Let me share with you a few numbers because I think it really helps. When a trail bridge goes, so, so we have done some extensive studies with our, our partners uh, in research and academia 
originally in Nicaragua and now being replicated actually in Rwanda by the University of Colorado and Yale University researchers. We have studied that the difference between a trail bridge being there and a trail bridge not being there results in statistics like this, Karim. When a trail bridge is present, 60% increase in women entering the labor force. Now, that's an interesting sneaky statistic. So let's talk about what that might mean. When a woman is able to enter the labor force, that means that she has opportunity to access safely going to and from whatever that work center is. That is not something that is always guaranteed. It also means that she and her family have the time and resource to go do that. We know that women globally often are caretakers of the home. They are transporters of food and water, and that that transport takes hours, sometimes days, especially when rivers are flooded. When they have a trail bridge and their paths to sustaining their families are far more efficient, they can actually join the labor force. That's a big deal. That is part of what contributes to an increase of 30%, 36% increase in labor market income after a trail bridge goes in. And I was talking with farmers just a second ago. And when a trail bridge is completed in a community, we see farmers increasing their profits by upwards of 75%. So imagine a farmer, a smallholder farmer, being able to increase the profitability of their farm 75%. And here in Rwanda, we see them increasing their take to market by at least 50%. So these are very tangible monetary outcomes that are a result of the trail bridge. And these don't even begin to capture the impacts that we see in education in healthcare, in participation in civic and government society, the benefit of trail bridges is really quite extensive. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. From uh, what you have described, it seems that um, there's not only benefit for the community that is isolated, but also for the community that is um, living far from the rural area. So we're building a bridge by building a trail bridge. We're connecting two different act activities and uh, we're making sure that the community that is struggling, they are um, getting enough um, economic activity uh, as well as the, um, the rest of the world the rest of the country is getting the benefit of benefiting from the uh, supply chain, uh, from the, um, the services and products that isolated communities can offer. You mentioned a little um, about the benefits uh, on um, healthcare and education of building a trail bridges. Can you please um, dive a little deeper into that and uh, how building trail bridges creates access to better healthcare and education? I'm gonna tell you a story that happened this past Wednesday. So we are currently building a bridge, 44 meters span, in Inharuka is the name of our bridge in the Kekenye district here in Rwanda. And I just visited this bridge. And as we were there on our visit, up above on one side of the bridge is the primary and the ECE school. And on the other side of the bridge and there for the river, is the secondary school. And surrounded on both sides of the valley are all of the homes that feed both of those schools. Mm -hmm. Two times a day, so think about four crossings because they run two academic sessions, small feet are crossing that bridge on the way to or from school. Before the bridge was built, Karim, they were using fallen timbers, fallen tree timbers with no decking and no railing to transport our most precious resource, our children across that river. Little tiny feet on big, unstable, gaping hole logs crossing a river that even in the dry season, which I'm fortunate that it is now, even in the dry season is a threat to life and quite literally limb. Imagine during the rainy season, when the river is flooding and rushing and children are still trying to get to school because they and their families know the value of education. It's very interesting that it, the, the country of Rwanda is deeply invested in their people, both urban and rural. And one of the things they know is key to their society's growth is access to education. Oftentimes in the developed world, we like to think of that as access being the cost of education. And that is certainly something that is universally a problem worldwide. Mm -hmm. 
But here in Rwanda, they also define access as literal physical ability to get to school. And that is part of what our trail bridges solve because now 365 days a year, regardless of the weather, it will be safe to cross and go to school. So that is an example of education uh, impacts. And our research program is quantifying that uh, in the statistics as well. But let's talk about healthcare because this is something that is critical for all of us. Before the world being as it is, before the pandemic, we had some really good research and study that people can see on our website, some beautiful stories as well, traditionally about women and families accessing healthcare. So imagine if somebody were sick in your home and you needed to take them, you're in a rural community, anyone living in a rural community can appreciate how the distance that is traveled to get to a health center, but imagine you needed to take them somewhere and imagine it was raining. And imagine that you had to choose between forging a flooding river, carrying your loved one above your head and hoping you don't slip and that all of you wash away or adding hours to your commute to be able to walk up the river to a vehicular bridge, which you are still carrying your loved one to walk additional hours out of the way to get to the healthcare center. Imagine if you were a woman in labor at this moment. So attended birth rates, things of that nature, these are very critical things that we were studying previously. But a very good question has come up, Kareem. What about in the time of COVID? Brandy, why is connection important in a time of COVID when we talk about, we switched our language, we started with isolation, now we get to distancing. But why would trail bridges, why is connection important in a time of COVID? Well, let's talk about vaccine distribution and let's think about that exact same story that I just shared with you. If you are a person who has fallen ill from the transmission of the virus and you need healthcare attention, distance matters, time matters, safety matters. We all know that in terms of reaching healthcare if you or a loved one is suffering from this terrible disease. But additionally, in a brighter side of the story, the ability to distribute vaccines equitably and throughout our rural communities is also a time issue. Community healthcare workers, the community health program is a globally proven strategy for delivering healthcare in isolated and rural populations. But community healthcare workers need to be able to distribute the vaccine, distribute it reliably. You have to be able to get that second shot if that's your program that you're on, and you have to be able to get it on time. And the vaccines broadly need to be able to stay cold as you go. Time, reliability, matters. So getting healthcare workers to the population to both treat but also prevent illness is critical. Additionally, our communities still need to be able to farm, feed their families, access market, and connectivity matters so much in being able to do that. So that that may help you get an idea of what the impacts for healthcare and education are. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for highlighting um, the description of accessibility. For us we, uh, who are living in the developed world and are privileged, we might think about the cost, um, we might think about availability, but uh, in rural areas, in isolated areas, it's actually being accessible. So whether there is a transport, where there is a pathway available and bridges, trail bridges make it a way, um, accessible for people. And when it comes to the education, it's the matter of the safety of children. You mentioned that uh, during the uh, flooded times, and it can be so incredibly dangerous if there is no uh, trail bridge or bridge available. And when it comes to uh, the healthcare and health issues, you mentioned that it's a, it might be a matter of the life of death because uh, when a person is in need of an emergency um, he- uh, healthcare and if they don't have um, roads or if they don't have a trail bridge to go through the clinic, they can. Um, the results can be fatal, and uh, the trail bridges are offering a solution, are offering um, a distribution, are offering a supply chain method that can um, make the lives of the isolated communities, members of the uh, rural areas, uh, to have better access and better quality of life. As healthcare and the education are basic needs, but they are so vital um, for 
the uh, detrimental social and economic health um, of the community. So that's very wonderful and important to uh, understand that. How do you determine where to build bridges and how does the process of building bridges look like? Oh my goodness. Well, those are very big questions. So let me see if I can start in the most broad kind of pictures. So we look to build trail bridges, first of all, where they're needed. All right. We're also uh, looking to see where we can get the most impact. So how many people uh, will. So where is the need? Where is the highest impact? But core to our model, Kareem, is where can we be in partnership with local governments whose role it is to build and maintain and provide infrastructure for their people? So need, impact and partnership are key. We're also, of course, looking to see where we can build safely. So we look at that macro, that's where we start. But here's where it gets really cool. So the question is, so let's say we've decided, well, East Africa, as is current, is uh, Bridges to Prosperity's priority. But exactly where do you figure out, how do you figure out exactly where to br- build a bridge and what bridge to build and what that looks like? There is some remarkable technology that we are starting to use thanks to some very generous and visionary partners that actually Kareem is allowing us to answer that question with a significant degree of certainty remotely. So utilizing satellite and GIS data overlaid with existing country data, we are literally able to see where the rivers are, see where people are traditionally crossing, map where the schools and the economic centers and the healthcare centers are, use that data to determine where it is likely to have the very best bridge built that we can bring to the table. But that's not where it ends. Using this advanced technology, we can not only say, hey, we think it should be about here. We can say, we actually think it is quite likely precisely here. And based upon that data that allows us to be able to see depth of the river channel at that place, we actually are nearing the ability to three-dimensionally model which kind of bridge we're going to build, slot it into that space, be able to understand the cost of that bridge, and then using the data that we have gathered through extensive third-party research, actually overlay to the government to be able to say, here's what the cost is, but here's the likely impact for you. So delivering ROI before we even put boots on the ground. Of course, we ground truth all of that work in partnership with the local communities because Kareem, as you know, as I know, nothing can replace the knowledge and story of the elders. We can talk to them and say, what was the 100 year flood? And they will show you the line. But we build very conservatively in that space. So that's how we actually know exactly where to build and what kind of bridge to build. Then it's a matter of how do we go build that? And this is an interesting thing in the model as well. We work to supply these bridges with almost all local materials. So the sand, the rock, the concrete, or the aggregate, as we call it, is all provided locally. Additionally, even the decking that we use, we're procuring right here locally in Rwanda in this instance. But you might say to me, Brandy, bridges are more than just rock, concrete, and decking. What about the cables? What about the towers? Where do you get those things? And this is part of that climate conversation that you were having, Kareem. You know, we work with some very generous partners globally who help donate used pipe and cable that is still 100% safe to use for our bridges and diverts giant waste, big waste out of landfills and repurposes it to good use. So we actually bring those things in country through a series of wonderful partners to allow us to do that. And we join it with the local materials right there on site. And this is my favorite part. We hire local labor to build the bridges. And the way that we build and the design of our bridges are simple, efficient, and replicable. So we can use labor right there from the community. We work together with them to give them the skills and the training development they need, not just to build the bridge at a very high standard. These are world-class bridges at a very high standard but also to maintain and care for those bridges in the future. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. That's my snapshot. I could go in for hours on bridge building, but that's my snapshot. 
That's a wonderful process to understand, to uh, hear. And um, what I really like about your approach, you mentioned you determine the need, but also the impact that the uh, bridges can make. So you take into consideration uh, the communities as well. And when uh, building bridges, uh, your approach is simple, yet very sustainable and innovative. You use different um, uh, modeling available. And also what I really, really like is that, as mentioned by you, the importance of talking to the locals, talking to the elderly who know the history of that particular area, who know all the challenges and all know and can um, can advise, can uh, tell, mentor us in the put us in their direction that can be beneficial for the future. So the impact of it will not be just for the one year, two year, three year, but it can be sustainable for decades and centuries to come. So that's very wonderful to understand and realize that. And you are currently, as uh, we talked earlier, you're currently in Rwanda visiting the team and we're seeing the uh, building of the uh, uh, more than dozen bridges. And I am sure you have many, many inspiring inspiring stories talking to the communities and the impact of the bridges that they had in the particular individuals or the community uh, in the general. Could you please uh, share some of the um, very meaningful and inspiring stories that you learned by communicating with the locals when uh, you are visiting? Well, on, on that bridge that I was just at, at in Haruka, that I asked our build team, I said, what does the community think about this bridge? Now imagine I'm asking this question and both sides of the river are lined with children watching. And, and as, as a, a woman who grew up with educators as parents, I'm loving this moment because they're not just watching oogling the visitors, though I'm sure that was part of it, but they're also watching engineering in action. So I'm watching these children and I'm saying to the, the build team, tell me, tell me, what does the community think of this bridge? And they're relaying the stories for me, specifically from the teachers about how excited they are that they won't have to worry about their students being washed away on the way to and from school. Like, just think about that, what that means to a community. As well, the marketplace is on either side. Perhaps in a better time, two years ago, I was here and we were inaugurating a bridge when we could have gatherings at that time. We're not back to there yet, but we were inaugurating a bridge. And Kareem, this was a, this was a very distant bridge. This bridge was not easy to, to get to. And I think many of us would, would look at that place on a map or we would drive by the closest road and see it from the distance and say, really, a bridge there? We went to that bridge and we spent four hours inaugurating that bridge with the community. And Karim, people streamed from the hillsides, from places I did not even know people were. They came for hours until literally it was hundreds of people at this bridge site, dancing, singing, crying together to celebrate what this bridge would mean for their community today. And you can tell the excitement for the generations to come. That moment changed my life. That moment truly changed my life. That was the moment that I sat there and I said, whatever I can do to help make this work possible, I will commit to do. You know, the, the, the great people who come up with the sustainable development goals are very smart. There's a reason that they put infrastructure as core to what is required to build a prosperous world. So, th so that is one. I will tell you a funny story that I heard this most recent trip is that at the end, so you can imagine there's so much digging at the beginning because you're building such deep holes and you're um, putting the rock in and putting the aggregate in. It takes time. And then the towers start to rise for the bridge. The abutments start to rise. But then at the end, for the community, it feels like magic because it happens so fast. So there are these tales because also depending on what your traffic pattern is, maybe you go to market once a week or every other week. To you as a community member, it feels like magic. All of a sudden overnight is the legend, the bridge is done. And so it's it's a really neat moment to see the community wait, wait for that magical moment where the next morning they're going to wake up and the bridge is there and ready to serve them. And uh, I think that's, that's so exciting. The final thing I would share with you is that all of this excitement that I'm sharing about the bridge building in the community, it's important to note that it bridges to prosperity. These are not 
These are not our bridges. We're not building them for us. These are being built hand in hand by the community with our support, but these are their bridges. They are building them. They are caring for them. They are maintaining them in the future. And so their stories are just the, 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 the little bit that I get to see are, are just the start or just the start of generations of stories of prosperity to come. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing such inspiring stories. And it sure feels like a magic and what you're doing for the community and the community is doing um, to itself is your help. It's uh, it's a celebration. Uh, it's a magic that brings them closer to economic prosperity and uh, uh, going far away from the uh, uh, rural isolation and being able to have a better future and better quality of life. So that's a wonderful so a story that is folding before our eyes and I applaud the communities that you're working and you, the organization of Bridges for Prosperity for doing that. If someone would like to support Bridges for Prosperity, how can they do that? Well, I would certainly encourage you to visit our website, bridgestoprosperity.org. You can also find us on all of the social media channels. And I tell you that because I promise you our Instagram feed is one of the most beautiful things on earth. If you want to see some gorgeous bridges, follow Bridges to Prosperity on Instagram. And within that, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter, you'll also be able to use our link tree. And if you are familiar with that technology, using the Bridges to Prosperity link tree, you're going to be able to read about the research studies that I told you. You're going to see articles and blogs uh, written by our staff. You're going to be able to see videos of our teams from all over the world speaking. So do check us out on social media and you can get to all of that through bridges to prosperity.org. T-O, bridges, T-O, prosperity.org. Wonderful. The link to the bridges to prosperity.org will be provided in the description. So you viewing and listening can go to the website and familiarize yourself with the wonderful work Brandy and the team um, at Bridges to Prosperity is doing. And also be inspired by the story through following their social media, Instagram, and all other social media accounts. Thank you so much, Brandy. It was wonderful to get to know you and the very meaningful and impactful work that your organization does. Thank you, Karim. It's been an honor to join you today. Thank you. For you listening, if you enjoyed this conversation, please press like and share button because this will show the YouTube and podcast algorithm that this conversation is important, that we need to work with isolated communities to create access to essential healthcare, education, and economic opportunities by building trail bridges. Thank you and see you in the next episode.